bomb in the cake. Don't worry, I used to be a bomb guy. Stand back! Hello, evening, morning, good night, good afternoon. Um, it's wine o'clock over here. Um, again, it's, 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 how did you say that, Matty? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yok. 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 Santé. Well, uh, Anik, you're now, uh, well, you're, you're multilingual anyways, but you're of so many different nationalities, I'm not sure anymore. But right now it's, uh, it's not Santé, it's, um... Salud. 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 <laughs> yeah, take a sip, man. <laughs> Matty, <laughs> Matty Doe, we're honored to have you with us for this strange, unique, bizarre uh, moment in history and, and, and a version of Utopia, of Utopia. Um, um, in our in our press releases, we call it um, uh, Utopia in the Year of Dystopia. Um, <laughs> and Anik, it's lovely to have you with us again, even if it's um, in this format. And we'll we're hopeful to have both of you with us uh, next year. Through the past few years um, of Utopia, we've had a spotlight section bringing to the spotlight uh, for um, our audience and uh, for. Um, international audiences or filmmakers that have that are that are up and coming or have had uh, quite a success in their early days in job in international genre filmmaking um we've had aaron moorhead and justin benson back in 2017 um and presented their three first films um likewise we've had isaac esban back in 2018 with his three first films and we're happy to have Matty Doe with us, Laos's first genre filmmaker, one of Laos's first female and any, any gender uh, filmmakers. And it's an honor and a, privi and a privilege, and thank you for um, allowing this. And Anik is an old friend and colleague and supporter of Utopia and um, as, is a, a collaborator and has been producer um, on Matty's um, two of three films, the, the, the latter two, um, Dear a Sister and The Long Walk. And uh, with us are Pablo Utin and Yuval Adal, uh, both longtime collaborators of Utopia and team members, Yuval from our programming team uh, for a number of years. Pablo will be the interviewer for this uh, discussion. I see we've also been joined by Ethan Gaffney, Israeli filmmaker, genre filmmaker. Uh, he has a short in our uh, competition this year. And um, um, uh, he's also, he was also on our programming team for the international foreign section. Good to have you with us, Ethan, and uh, jump in and, and, or, or tell Pablo or Yuval if you have any questions you'd like to, to in insert. Um, a short, a brief uh, presentation on, um, um, this is going to take like take the entire uh, interview if I read all of this, but Anik, starting with you, will she, um, Anik has had a, um, a long career in, in uh, different film distributors in Switzerland and, and distributors and um, sales uh, companies, both in Switzerland and in Paris. Uh, but right now, I think the, um, um, well, not, she doesn't have one single important role. She has quite a few, uh, both on the uh, international programming section for Fantastic Fest in Austin, Austin Texas, as uh, also on the programming team for Sigis International Fantastic Film Festival, where the longest running, I think, and, uh, um, and, and, and two of the largest film festivals in the genre film, uh, in, the, in, the, in the genre field in the world. Uh, she currently lives in Sigis. She moved there, I think, a year and a half ago. Yeah. Anyway, to, and, yeah. um, and uh, um, if that was not enough, well, she's also, she's also um, a, a film producer on the side. She has a side hustle as a film producer. And if all of that was not enough, she took over as executive director for the Frontiers, Frontiers um, uh, platform jointly run by uh, Fantasia Film Festival 
the other North American uh, huge um, genre film festival and uh, the Cannes Film Market, the Cannes Marché du Film. So that was a long introduction, uh, but uh, um, quite, um, and you're worthy for, you know, of all of those um, accolades and um, thank you for the work you're, you're doing to promote uh, genre cinema. I think you've done a remarkable job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> one, of the, one of the great things you've done is, um, well, um, is um, I think allowed uh, Matty's um, unique uh, narrative and aesthetic and talent and um, um, to be brought to a wider audience. I hope that's an agreeable statement. It was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> it was it's accident. so funny listening to him talk about it like it's fucking intentional or it was, something. It was an accident. I'm like trying to keep it straight we'll face. Tell you all about I think it. that's one yeah. of our first questions. Yeah, uh, I'm trying to keep a straight face like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, like it was so official. <laughs> for um for Maddie, I'm gonna I'm gonna read what you what you what you sent us. If you've met Matty Doe, uh, she's shown you photos of her dogs. Uh, My dog is squeaking these... right now in the background. Did All right, you hear? You uh, if you've seen her movies, then you've seen her dogs act. Over the years, Maddie's <laughs> dogs have starred in a few good ghost stories that have screened at Venice's Giornate degli, uh, degli Ottori. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce that well in Italian. I hope I did that well. Um, that was right. <laughs> uh, Fantastic Fest, Sigis, Toronto, Busan, and quite a few other festivals. Um, they, the dogs, headlined project markets, including Fontier Selection uh, for um, um, Macau's inaugural Crouching Tigers um, program. Um, um, Matty's dogs have garnered recognition as Laos's first, as, as uh, major players in Laos's first submission to the 90th Academy Awards. Uh, Matty's dogs lives, uh, live in um, uh, Vientiane. Um, um, the Laos capital, uh, where they're helping her, um, they're, where they're helping um, Matty uh, develop the country's film industry. Uh, Matty also has two cats, but uh, the little beasts refuse to take direction. So that was uh, lovely. Thank you for um, um, sending that over. With that, I'll hand over uh, the microphone, the digital microphone, to Dr. Pablo Utin. Um, our resident expert on all things uh, genre and filmmaking, literally wrote the book or books on Israeli cinema and he has quite a few other books to write still. And I hope what, some of them will be on genre cinema. Um, take it away, Pablo. Okay, hi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna Sorry. shut up now, I'm gonna mute this now. Yeah, no, I, I will be short because we need to start. I will just say that we will divide this uh, conversation into two parts. We will talk, the first part, we'll talk more about production and history, or maybe, you know, the, the surroundings of, of the films, uh, how they got made and the uh, society of Laos and film industry in Laos and stuff. And the second part will be more about style and themes. So we'll get into the films into your style, Mati, and we'll try to understand and ask questions that uh, we are curious to know about. Uh, but maybe Yuval is with us and he wanted to start. I want him to start asking. So uh, would you like to start with the industry stuff? And, and... Yeah, um, I would love it. I, I think I would like to start uh, with a question a bit about uh, the different or the process you've done with uh, each films and between the films. Uh, and I mean, I think uh, we can see that in each film that you made, the production value and story-wise, it became bigger and bigger and uh, more complex. And uh, a bit about how it felt and uh, how this process uh, uh, gone on. And do you think it's changed the way that uh, you tell a story uh, in each film? Um, I'll start with the last part. Like it definitely does not change uh what i want to tell in this story but what it does change is like how possible certain things are because like you can't have a fucking rocket shooting across the sky without a little bit of budget you know what i mean and you're like you you have to calculate how much blood you can splatter around set if with according to your budget because believe it or not like that fake blood shit has a cost <laughs> I mean, there's a cost associated with it we have to pay over um, extra luggage fees just to get it here from France because we don't have fake blood here in Laos. And the homemade stuff attracts too many flies, which is like really bad for continuity. Um, 
but like real blood only costs 50 cents for a bag here so that's like it's just you know it doesn't smell good and the actors don't like real blood being thrown on them so that that kind of sucks but i feel relatively unchanged by um the amount of money and budget increasing what does change is um the amount of responsibility because suddenly now like annick and i are more beholden to other people because in the beginning it was just our money or it was like money that we didn't have to give back because it was like sponsorships and grants and stuff right but now it's like now each film increases in budget and then there's like financiers involved investors involved and we it's a really heavy burden to know that if you fuck up that's not your money that you're going to lose and that's not your money that you're burning so Annick and I are always very shrewd about how we approach things you know we're not there to be like all the things we want all the things because we have money no because it's like it's not our money and we're responsible for that if something happens but um the amount of stress actually stays the same in fact sometimes I kind of wish um, I could just go back to doing a super no budget artsy independent film like Gently because we took like 60 days to make that fucking film. We just, when the electricity went out, we just like sat around the house and like had beers until the electricity came back, petting the dog, just like, oh, it's fine. Oh, you're not available. Come back next week. We'll, we'll, we'll shoot the scene again next week. And, you know, there's a certain kind of not knowing the consequences that was really fun in Dentally, but now we know the consequences and that's a little scarier, right? <laughs> Things change uh, for you a lot when Annika came into the picture. You, the, the first movie you did it by yourself with your husband, right? But in the second picture, Annika uh, entered. Annika, can you tell what? us how did you enter, to, right? I'm, yeah, I mean, so Wait, maybe you can talk about the first one, about Chance I'll see the first one, then you tell them the story of how you entered, because that's pretty good. Okay, cool. <laughs> so the first one, yeah, it changed a lot of things, because um, I still have to run production on set here in Laos, because Lao is a very obscure language. It's not very well known, you know. Um, not very many people speak Lao, and every production I do has foreign co-production aspects, foreign people, foreign team helping. And so like my brains and synapses are still firing at 110% because I'm still on set handling everything at once. But what has changed with Annick being here is like, she's become the ally that I needed so that there are certain problems and there are certain issues that normally would just fall on mine and my husband's shoulders that I can rely on her for. Like she's there to protect me She's there to stand up for me. She's there to take care of the problems and the fires that are burning that um, I shouldn't be taking care of. I should be focusing on the set. I should be focusing on the story and the actors and just making the damn film. I don't need to be fighting with other producers who are being shady as fuck. She can do that for me now, you know? Yeah. And then, so um, how I met Maddie really is, um, um, a journalist called Todd Brown, who also works with XYZ, had written a piece about Chantilly on uh, a website that is now called Screen Anarchy. Um, and I read that and because I still collaborate with a company, sales company called Raven Banner in Canada. And I was interested because it was like the first genre feature made in Laos. So I was interested in seeing if, you know, if potentially, you know, we could actually sign this on. And so I contacted Maddie and uh, she sent me the link. I watched it and I really liked Chantilly, but it wasn't for our audiences. It was a little bit too slow. Um, it wasn't really made for Western audiences. So we kind of kept in touch, but then we actually really met at Fantastic Fest. And because the film was selected at Fantastic Fest, it was, at, what was it, 2015, 14, 14. Okay, so we, we met and, um, and we kind of connected and then we, we kept in touch and then I met her again because Maddie was invited at uh, uh, La Fabrique de Cinéma du Monde in Cannes for the program to actually, for her film, Dear Sister. Um, so we met again, we had fun in Cannes and then she went to Toronto because she got selected to the film lab in Toronto and I was there so I met her again and then she told me that she was actually going to Amiens for her film that I mean the the project the script had been selected for a co-production market um, in Amiens which is about an hour away from Paris and 
I said, well, I'm back in Paris at the time, so I could come visit you. And we were kind of joking about, you know, like, yeah, I could come or not. But I was like, I didn't want to, I was just too cheap to pay for my hotel room. So I said, why don't you tell them that your French producer is coming and try to get me a free hotel room? And, and she said, well, I don't know if it's going to work, but I will, will try. And no, she did. I was like, it's next totally morning, work because they wouldn't pay for Duomini to go, remember? They said that they'd give Duomini a free room. I was like, this is totally going to work. It's going to yeah, work. Laughs, yeah, but then, you know, you're in Paris, so... And so they actually wrote me back the next day, very officially saying they were so happy to meet, you know, the French producer of Maddie Doe, but I wasn't her producer. <laughs> that was all fake. Well, so, he doesn't want uh, to go I, get drunk on Christmas wine at the market. At the Christmas market. So we're like, okay, I'll just come and see what happens. But then I was told I had to pitch the film with her. So <laughs> it was like, okay. So we, we, we worked on the pitch for about four or five hours in the night before. And then we faked the pitch. <laughs> yeah. And then, totally and then we didn't win. I mean, you know, Maddie didn't win because I wasn't her producer yet. But then we were drinking and I said, you know, I don't know how. We got real we close to winning, remember? The poverty poor. We were one. close to, yeah. yeah. But basically, we, said, we were tied. They had yes. to do an extra deliberation That's just true. to break our tie. Yeah. yeah. But then I said, you know, I don't know how, but if you want me to produce or help you produce the film, I can do that. And then I had no clue about production. I had never submitted any file to the CNC in France or the Cinema du Monde or whatever. But I was like, well, I knew a few people. I guess we could try and just put a file together. And that's how like, we okay. you know, started working <laughs> together, just over a free hotel night. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> free hotel room, ginger bread and hot wine. <laughs> but then Mother we really, that is the thing which is incredible is that we completely 100% <laughs> connected. Um, and I think we connected not only like on the, friendship level but also on the artistic level and and on the fun level and i think it's also like a, this thing that we have the mutual respect and the sincerity and honesty that we have for each other that actually makes this work because i, I wouldn't have worked with her again on the long walk and uh and so i think that something we we just really sparked and 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 i'm really glad you know that you know she's st she still wants me as her producer <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I mean, the reality is you don't work with people you don't fucking like again, right? You continue to try and add on to your team. So like when you have a good team, you try to keep those people. Of course, like you end up working with a lot of different people in the future and different people are better for certain projects than others. Um, so I, if I've had multiple DOPs now, it doesn't mean that one DOP is going to be my forever DOP. It would be nice, but that's not always reality. But you want to keep your team and you want to always like just build onto that team. And if they're fuckers, you don't want to bring them back. <laughs> well, Matty, before you met Anik, this, this is a very strange uh, or very impressive uh, jump you did because you, you weren't uh, in a film industry, you weren't like, you didn't study cinema. You, you were a dancer, right? A ballet dancer and a, and a makeup artist. Uh, and, and suddenly you found yourself making a film and then this film is low budget and then this film gets to all these festivals uh, so can, can you tell for people who, who don't know the story how, how, how did that happen like you are a ballet dancer i mean i'm a really sucky ballet dancer so it's really good that i'm like pretty okay at film <laughs> thank god <laughs> actually two of my friends who are also ballet dancers in israel are going to be watching this so like they'll laugh because they know they fucking know <laughs> <laughs> um no so like my heart and my passion is still ballet i i love ballet but the reality is like i don't have the right body and the right talent for it and um that's something you learn really quick in in a vocation like ballet you stand there and you stare at yourself in the mirror russian teacher stands in front of you and tells you how shitty you are and there's no there's no faking it, you know, even in film, I feel like people can fake it. Like your editor can like save your film for you to a certain degree. The, um, yeah, the Alex said team. she's producer and she wasn't, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean like to a certain degree, if the story sucks and the acting sucks, I mean, that's really hard to save. But to a certain degree, you can save yourself uh, you can hide it, or you can do that whole networking thing where if you have a lot of famous friends, you continue to like fail upwards. You see that a lot in Hollywood, actually, like people who continually fail up for some reason. They fail up. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a miracle. It's yeah. like they defy gravity. <laughs> this is a really but bad movie. Cannot. Let's give you a better, but more, more money to make the next one. <laughs> more money to suck some more. Yeah. That does not happen in ballet. 
it just it's impossible that never happens in ballet um if you suck everybody sees it maybe if you're like the favorite of the director the the ad the artistic director which is basically the producer you might get a couple starring roles but then like everybody else sees it and then it doesn't last long right because you physically can't do it it's not like in film where the rest of the team can do it for you it's like you physically can't do it. You physically can't turn. You physically can't lift your leg up. You physically can't jump. And so being in ballet actually tempered me for film because like all the difficulty, all the hard work, all the stress and the just, um, just understanding of criticizing yourself and understanding your faults. When I came into film, it was like, wow, this is a lot. I don't want to say like easier, but... <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's really, there's, the burden is more shared, I guess you could say. It's not like all on me to try and be like miraculously amazing and good, you know? And in ballet, the burden is like really only on you. <laughs> so you got to Laos and Laos didn't have a really a film industry till uh, 10, 12 years ago. Is hey, I mean, we still, our film industry is still really not, it's not there. I mean, we don't even have two films a year. So like, you know, people get offended when I say that Lao doesn't have a film industry because of course there are other filmmakers and they're working on projects and they're making movies or they're trying to make movies or they're doing other things. But like, it's hard to say that we have a film industry if we don't even make three films a year, right? Like, so the reality is we're still in a, we're still in a really bad place for a Lao film. We have no government funding for film, no grant money for film. Uh, in, no an early place. in an early What's that? place. Maybe in an early place. I don't yeah. know. I mean, we are prepubescent in film. <laughs> <laughs> so so now so now I gotta interfere. I gotta ask a question. <clears throat> if you have no film industry, no grants, no support, nothing at all. How the hell did you get in? Did you, get, did you, you know, did you get into this? Like, what came over? What what made you say one day? Well, just fuck it, I'll do it. I mean, that's a, well, that's no, amazing. It's, it's, it's not like, what happened. It, I'll make a film. You didn't that's, say that. Right? Well, no, I did not say that in the beginning. But then that that's my attitude. It was like, fuck it, I'll just make a film. So like, this sounds horrible. Love brought me into film, right? Anik, love pushed me into film. My husband put me in film. Uh, my husband is a very talented screenwriter. Um, he, he's been writing for the majority of his life. Like since uh, his university years, he's, he had had his mindset on screenwriting, even though he is a political science major. That's kind of odd. But um, so he'd been writing for hire for other people and he'd been doing edits and fixes for other people. And when we came to Lao, I had no intention of exploring film here at all. I was looking at studio spaces to see if I could start a ballet school here or not even stay here because I had come to see my father. I thought my father was like having problems, but my father was fine. Um, I thought he married a gold digger, but you know, he just married someone crazy was all. So he, he was all right. <laughs> so we were going to I was like should I stay like he obviously doesn't need me to watch over him you know he's a big boy or what should we do and so we were there for only a, a few weeks and then my husband met somebody who was involved with the Luang Prabang Film Festival and they invited us to come to a press conference and crash a party there and I was like we can't crash a party because you know having grown up in America and having lived in Europe so you don't just crash a fucking official festival party for some event. And I was like, no, no, it's loud. It's okay. You just walk in and you just drink the alcohol and pretend like you belong there. Put, put some nice clothes on. It's fine. And um, so we did. I got really wasted and we met Lao Art Media there, which Anik knows them very well, My our Lao producers. <laughs> and they were the pioneers of Lao cinema. Um, Anusan was the first man to make film post-revolution. Well, not the first, there was one film, a black and white film in 1985 or 84 called Red Lotus, but it was like a one-off thing. Um, so he was the first one to like make a commercial type film after, the, after the regime change. Yeah, in 2009, yeah. Yeah. yeah, in the early uh, 2000s. And now we are talking about 2012, you're there in the party or something like that? Yes, yeah, 2010. 10. 2010, I was there so at the party. It's a new, new thing. 
it was I had I was there for the free drinks like literally that's the only reason why I was there and to help translate for my husband because he was like we got to go see these film people like um, I want to meet other screenwriters and I want to see what projects are people are working on because there's like nothing here and there really wasn't there was like nothing happening and then when we got there he met the department of cinema people and we're like oh there's a department of cinema for what <laughs> like and they're like we need content and we don't know <laughs> like we're just here and um he met Dongmane, who was also the first screenwriter and um they were like let's have a meeting oh my god do you write film you're a screenwriter like come to Lao art media office tomorrow and like let's talk and we're like yeah okay like let's talk so the next day um we went to their office and we just thought it was going to be like a meet and greet kind of thing like hey hi oh nice office but no they like walked us in and i was there to translate for my husband because he's american um and they're like this is your office this room it has air conditioning and it has wi-fi and we're like woo wi-fi because in 2010 we didn't have fucking wi-fi in Lao. it was like you had to go to an internet cafe and pay a dollar per hour to use internet, like really slow internet. <laughs> and then, um, so he's like, all right, like I'm hired. And they're like, yeah, make us a movie, write us some content. And he's like, I can do that for you. And I was like, yeah, okay, you can do that. And then they're like, and direct a film for us. And he was like, I can't do that. Like, no, that I, I don't do that. You know, writers, they like, shackle us in a dark room and don't let us out until like the script is finished and then they just like hide us behind the camera where no one will see us and we just chain smoke <laughs> in a stressed fashion mm -hmm. and um he's like i can't even speak loud like how can i direct a loud film and they were all like ah oh, shit that sucks like white boy can't direct us a film <laughs> and, um i was just sitting there like oh that's too bad like i guess we're gonna have to go back to the internet cafe and he was like <laughs> freaking out because he's like air conditioning and wi-fi and like a private space that he can write without being disturbed by me and he's like well she can direct like she speaks a language fluently she can totally direct i mean she has years of performing arts experience you know and she's done so much in performing arts and they're just like have you and i was like um that's not a lie <laughs> it's like i do speak well <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, and they were like, oh, this is amazing. Oh my God. And they like broke up whiskey and beer. We were like totally mis mixing whiskey and beer. And they're like, let's celebrate. We have a new director and we have a new film. And I was just like, what the fuck is going on here? I, I seriously was like, I wanted to vomit on my own shoes, but maybe it was the whiskey. And they're like, this is amazing. And then as they were getting drunk, they're like, oh my God, has there like ever been a woman who's directed film in our country? And they were like, oh, there's documentary, there's short films. And they're like, oh, Lao Art Media has the first female film director in the country. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> Let me make a fucking film now. <laughs> so they, they supported, they, they, they put the money for you to make the first film, the, the Chantali. They supported all the equipment and yeah. all of the team, which we were five people total. <laughs> um, and food actually they brought us two meals sometimes three meals a day um and they basically facilitated anything that i needed on on set and on set was my house <laughs> and i got the extra money to pay the actors by um begging a beer company called nam kong beer to give us a sponsorship and so they gave us $5,000, but when I, at first they paid quite late. And when I went and asked them for the actual cash, they only gave me $4,500. Hmm. And I was like, well, where's the other 500? You promised me five, $5,000 to make this film with product placement in it. And they're like, oh, oh, the other $500 is in product placement. And they like brought out this like palette yeah. of beer <laughs> for us <laughs> <laughs> to drink and to use in the film. And we're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> So um, people who watch the film will notice there's a lot of beer in the film because <laughs> that was one of our free props. <laughs> yeah, so they gave me 4,500 bucks to make a film and I made the film. And Anna and goes like, yeah, no, not freedom, this film. Right? You, you had total freedom. They didn't say, oh, don't make a horror <laughs> film or don't make ghost films. You, they just wanted you to make something in a sense. That, that That's... Nam Kong Beer didn't give a shit what kind of film I made. They just wanted their product in the film. Yeah. Um, 
Lao Art Media was just so excited that I was going to make a film. They were nervous, rightly so, about me making a ghost film, a genre film, um, because there had never really been one that was completely Lao before. And neither had there really been one that was like in such a casual um, family situation. Before my film, like films were kind of a little bit formal, like the girls wore the traditional skirt. They spoke, uh, they spoke as if they were a book, you know, like girls, boyfriends and girlfriends calling each other like by their formal names and stuff like that. It, it wasn't very natural. I guess you could almost say like an old play, like a theater an old theater play. But my film, and also one of my contemporaries um, who made At the Horizon around that same time, we were the first to really like portray people in a more natural setting, moving, talking naturally, wearing clothes in daily life. Like my film was one of the first where like the girls were in pajamas and like had a, a like a halter dress on and, you know, um, but what happened was like the government censored us. They totally banned my film. Like they rejected it. Not, they won't, they'll say, we didn't ban it, Maddie. We just refused to let it happen. <laughs> but this, <laughs> this is not the script. This is the, the, the made film. It, when, when the film the, was ready, it, Well, the original idea of it. They, um, so the first script and they were just like, oh, okay. we've never had a ghost film before. And you know, it, it was uncomfortable for them to do a supernatural film and to do a genre film. And I remember when they sent us a document with a big like rejection <laughs> stamp on it. I was like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck happened? And, you know, I just saw them and we're like, yeah, well, that's life. We have censorship. I got and I was like, may I interject? I, I have to kind of, um, um, what's the, I mean, why is, what's the uncomfortableness about? If you oh, I'll explain that because it's coming up. Right. Like they were super yeah. uncomfortable, and they didn't explain it. They're just like no supernatural film. And so I did something that I guess I, I know now is really unprecedented for Lao. And I took the document and I went back and requested to speak to them because it's a department of cinema. I met them at that party. Like, what's their job except to facilitate filmmakers, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's why you're there. And so like I was like knock knock knock, and they're like. Like, what the fuck are you doing here? And I was like, hey, like, can we talk? I just want to know why my film is rejected. Like, why did I get banned? And they're just like, I mean, it's a supernatural film. And Maddie, like, we're Marxist. <laughs> and I was like, what? Like, what does that have to do with anything? And they try to, like, at first they try to go by the fact that, you know, they don't want to promote supernatural beliefs to the wide general populations and they don't want to promote the unrealistic and I was like it's a film like it's an actual fiction film it's not a documentary um I'm not promoting any belief and so I listened to their concerns I was like it's not like there's a killer on the loose and even if there were like the incidences of copycat killing are extremely rare zero to none basically and like I'm not pushing anyone to believe anything. And then I realized that it was just because it was the first, you guys. And they had never experienced anything like that. And understandably, like if somebody higher up in the Department of Cinema got pissed and they had allowed it to happen, then mm -hmm. it would be on their heads. They'd be responsible for that. So they needed to feel comfortable with letting something pass that they weren't gonna get in trouble for. And so I listened to their concern and it was valid, you know? So I was like, okay like there's never been a movie like this so if you feel like this might promote supernatural spiritual beliefs I mean first of all you have a spirit shrine outside your door and they're like yeah because we're loud and I was like exactly exactly all loud people believe in the supernatural go to any house and they have a shrine you know a spirit house so I'm just like showing real life like what people believe but what if I put a character that doesn't believe in there the dad because initially the dad was um not such a not such a asshole and he was not such a prominent character in the film and he's the one who doesn't believe and then we have one that is in the middle the cousin and then we have like the one on the side of logic you know the doctor, the doctor. guy yeah. yeah and then the audience can choose who they like sympathize with right right and they're like yeah okay like let's try this and they 
past the film and that's gently as you know it they really took a big step you know <laughs> that's amazing and, and and you got to a lot of festivals in that, that, that's also was surprising for you how, how was the this that you made the film and then you you just send it to the festivals and get there you you got contacts you <laughs> how, how does that happen like a lot of people like make films and then they don't get into festivals or no that was also an accident as well <laughs> um so in my life i i say i have two mentors and that's todd brown and anik the these two are the ones who guide me through the intricacies of the film industry and not getting fucked in film um and they also help me to understand what the current film uh world is like right now including festivals and sales and etc I'm very lucky because these two have experience in all of the above. Um, I didn't even know to be excited about festivals. I didn't know what a festival was. I, I had never really been to a film festival before. Like I went to a film at, what is it even called? Um, at Slam Dance once because my friend bought me a ticket and said, oh yeah, let's go see this film at Slam Dance. And that was inside like a hotel room or something like a hotel conference room. I, I don't know how to describe it. Like, a ball, I guess Sundance is like that, right? They just put up a screen in like a, a, a ballroom. And so it didn't feel like amazing to me. It's like, oh, I'm cold. I walked out. I had a pizza with my friends. I went and watch this movie and I walked out. It was great. Okay. And then, um, yeah, that was the only festival experience I'd ever had. Um, so when... I first met Todd Brown, he had heard that my film played at Long Bang Film Festival, um, but it was a working print. It wasn't a finished film. And um, Curtis Winston from uh, in Bangkok had written about it on his blog. He used to be a really famous film blogger in Thailand. And he was like impressed with the film and how it was different from any of the other films he'd seen before. And Todd Brown read it online because this man really has his finger on the pulse of Asian cinema. Like he's very into Asian cinema. And um, he found my email address through the Long Pabang people, I guess. And when he wrote me, I had no idea who the fuck this guy was. I was just like, some dude wants to see my unfinished film. Like Long Pabang Film Festival at that time, it was like the first or second edition, didn't feel like a film festival either. It felt like the kind of events that NGOs put on here in Laos, where it's like, hey, villagers, come and sit outside and watch this movie you know like that's what it felt like so like that wasn't a film festival that was as far as I knew what a film festival was was these two experiences and so this Todd Brown guy writes me from XYZ and Twitch at the time it was Twitch now it's um, Screen Anarchy and he was like hey I heard about this film you're making I never saw a Lao film before um, would you mind letting me see it and I was like yeah sure why the fuck not I mean it's not finished dude <laughs> and I sent it and he sent me notes back, you guys. Like, this, he's so nice. Like, I was just like, wow, this guy that I don't even know, like, he has such good advice. Holy shit. Like, I like him. And I, like, was writing back and forth to him, like, talking about, like, why I could do this or how I could fix this or how I couldn't fix that because I don't have the footage and explaining to him what I was going for. And then one day, like, I left my email open on my desk um, and he was just like, hey, like, your film is really great. It's really unique. Do you mind if I submit it to some festivals? And I was like, yeah, sure, whatever, go ahead. And he was like, I'm going to submit it to Fantastic Fest for you, okay? And I was like, yeah, sure, do it, whatever. <laughs> no idea what the fuck Fantastic Fest was. Like, I'm sorry to say, Anik, like, I, I didn't know. And Chris saw my emails open one day on my laptop, and he saw Todd Brown's name and XYZ, <laughs> and he was like, do you know who that Don't is? Know. And I was like, no, like, who the fuck is that? He's like some dude. And he's like, X, Y, Z. Like, and he sat me down and he turned the raid on for me. He was like, oh yeah, I saw that movie with my dad. Yeah, we like it. And he was like, this is X, Y, Z, Maddie. And I was like, okay, yeah. <laughs> and then like a few, I don't remember, like a few weeks later, we get this acceptance letter from Fantastic Fest and I was like, Oh, that's so nice. They want to play my film, but I don't know what a DCP is. Um, I mean, like, can I send them a disc or something? And Chris was like freaking out. You know, he's like, oh my fucking God, Maddie, you got in a fantastic fest. Oh my fucking God, you have to go. And I was like, I can't go. It's in America. And they're not paying for my plane ticket. Because at that time I was like this new filmmaker, you know, like 
they pay plane tickets for like more well-known filmmakers hmm. and um i was like fuck that it's like two thousand dollars to go to america hell no where am i gonna stay he's like it doesn't matter where you're gonna stay like we need to find the money for you to go to that festival and we need to find a way for you to stay there because like this is a once in a lifetime experience, Maddie. Like some people, like you said, work their whole lives to get into a festival like Fantastic Fest and they don't get in. And I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. And so we borrowed money from my dad we, <laughs> because I didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. We borrowed money from my dad and I went to Fantastic Fest and I, it like blew my fucking mind. Like I had no idea that there were like hundreds, thousands of people who come and watch movies like back to back in the cinema experience, um, the kinds of films that are being made. Like, I didn't know people were making like such weird, crazy auteur films like that because before that I hadn't seen very many films either because when you're teaching and dancing ballet, you don't really have a lot of time to watch films. I'd seen like, you know, the, the popcorn films that play in the cinema. That's all I had ever really seen. Um, and I was just like, what the fuck is going on here? And everybody was just like, it was an intense experience because I literally thought Fantastic Fest was going to be like, you go to a high school gym with like 50 fold out chairs and that they were going to give you like a red plastic cup with like fruit juice and like another red plastic cup with popcorn in it. And you're just going to sit there in this auditorium and they're going to roll the TV out in wheels. Like that's what I thought <laughs> Fantastic Fest was going to be. And then I met Anik. <laughs> We, somehow we lost Pablo, but I'm going to ask a question and I'm going to check what, what happened with Pablo, but this was, you were with Chris back there. Was you, were with, you were with your husband. Oh, no. no. No? We didn't have enough. I couldn't borrow that much money to pay for my husband's plane ticket, too. <laughs> I was by myself. I had no idea what was going on. Like, And the time zone was so different that like, I couldn't even call him to ask him what the fuck was going on. That's how I became friends with Anik because like I was so lost and I didn't know anyone. And admittedly, like I made a lot of friends with the audience members during my first film because I didn't know anyone. And the audience people were all like just staring at me, you know, like that's a filmmaker, but I didn't know that. So I was like, oh, they're looking at me. So let's, I'll go talk to them. And then we like became really good friends. So me and the audience people became really good friends, but there's still like an amount of distance between filmmaker and audience always, of course, right? And all the other filmmakers felt so like different from me. Their entire lives revolved around film. Their dreams were to be here at Fantastic Fest and to become a filmmaker and to make film. And I was just like some bitch that accidentally made this $4,000 film and ended up here. And like, I liked that they kept giving me food and free drinks, like that was fucking awesome. But then, they, we were invited to dinner at Tim Tim you, League's house. Did you not feel distanced? Because um, there's like an internal lingo to this community and there's, you know, people kind mm -hmm. of go on, you know, these threads in conversation about, you know, this specific director and that specific scene in that specific film. Oh, I had no idea what they were talking about at all. Like but, at all. Yeah, but you were like, Fuck that, I'm fine. You were fine with that. Because it can be a, a really bewildering experience. It's, and, you know, it uh, continues to be bewildering for me, right, <laughs> Anik? <laughs> like sometimes we, we like get the conversations with people and I'm just like lost. The, the, the funniest thing actually about Maddie is because people who watch this don't know is like she has, she has no clue about who film, like famous filmmakers are. Like when she meets someone like with a name, she, she has no clue. So when she met Eli Roth, that everyone here in the room knows. Oh yeah, I had no idea. Was like, who are was. you? Like, and it's like, you know what? I mean, it. So those are the situations yeah, that are very funny because she just starts talking to people and she has no clue who she's talking to. Yeah. 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 I'm gonna interject. I'm gonna say something. That's um, <coughs> the there's a there's a huge importance to um, cutting down verticals and bringing together people and um, from dis different disciplines because it humbles people because you might know a lot of you know you might be really really, really well respected and know a lot about know know your shit in one specific field and that kind of feel gets you empowered but you might not know anything about this other field mm -hmm. and when you bring together Important. different disciplines um that have expertise in different fields 
it humbles people and you know you can learn a lot if you're into if you're able to do that yeah right. Anik, but okay no, 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 what, I say that, that what i want to say is that and and i think that what really also helped maddie is the fact that she doesn't come from a film background so she hasn't gone to film school she hasn't watched as many films as i have so there's a knowledge that I have that she doesn't have and she comes Very with- Very few of people watch as many films as you have. <laughs> no, but what I'm saying is like, you, you came into the business without really knowing about any films and you were basically kind of like, um, like a virgin in film where you didn't have all these references that you wanted to copy or like mm -hmm. i would love to make cinema like this guy or this guy mm -hmm. so you brought in from the very beginning your own voice you know to film mm -hmm. which i think was really great and mm -hmm. and maybe that's why also we connected because when i saw your film then i knew it was it was something original that i hadn't seen before and you keep doing this you know it's like there's no influence like this outside influence didn't exist when you started in the film business and doing your own films and, and the stories. And challenges don't really exist too. Like one of the things that I find really funny about um, sometimes now I feel like I get burdened because um, now I know how hard certain things are in film. But in the beginning, like Anik and Chris never stopped me from doing something that people who go to film school or people who are obsessed with studying film or emulating film masters consider hard or challenging. They'll be like, oh, I wanna do this tracking shot or, oh, I want to have this kind of scene or this something, something, right? Something really difficult. And I don't understand that that's something difficult or that that's something that maybe you shouldn't approach on your second film or on your, no, on no, your first well, film. That, you know who else got into filmmaking without knowing anything about film coming from a different discipline? I, I can think of two examples. I mean, there are obviously many, many examples, but um the two uh interesting ones uh, which um, you know um, they might flatter you uh, are um alejandro Hodorowski and orson wells orson wells mm -hmm. yes he was a writer right yeah he was a he yeah, was the writer theater. and um and a, and a radio, radio theater uh, and a I, I, theater director and he used a lot of um theater um uh, techniques in 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 or in, in citizen Kane. Kane. And oh. uh, a lot of, a lot of, um, um, he got a lot of notes on, well, you can't do that, or yeah, we I don't never get that, that from Anik and Chris. The, there is they a, never tell me I can't do that. There's they just, that they inner... just stand back and like smile, like that smile that Anik's smiling right now, and they're like, oh, well, how are you going to do it? Like, <laughs> here's your budget. This is how much you have. Like, how do you propose to do it? And I'll be like, we'll just do it like this, and they're like, no. Oh. <laughs> be our guest <laughs> so that's Wellesian yeah. and Hodorowsky yeah no, and I, who? So, Hodorowsky it's a Mexican oh Dune right um, yeah now Hodorowsky Dune the Dune that didn't yeah yeah anyway the the way I, also there is a um, parallel in the way that you learned what you had to learn about cinema by reading like a book right your husband gave you a book and they said i don't know you said i don't know how to direct and he gave you a book and you say learn this and and, and that's all oh definitely actually i still have that book that book is like it's covered in dust right now but it's like one of my greatest souvenirs like we are very minimalist um we don't have a lot of stuff like furniture and stuff but every time we move house like we still take that book with us it's called um directing it's <laughs> that's it that's minimalist it. it's called directing and, does it have um, for dummies no i wish it did because that would be even like more amazing if it was like one of those directing for dummies yellow books right mm. no it's called directing um fuck chris oh he has headphones on i think he can't hear me who's the right who's the author of that book oh yeah I read it's like a it. first year college textbook you guys like literally, and you wonder how updated it was. Like at the end, um, there's there's a note after the book, you know, and it's like now that you've learned about all the different techniques of directing and you know what goes into directing, um, who knows the future of film and cinema may change now that they're starting to introduce digital technology. <laughs> but no one knows if digital technology will be sustainable. And I'm <laughs> just like that's the old fucking book is. <laughs> I think the idea so, that <laughs> it was great. Like I did, I was like freaking out because we got really drunk with um, Anisan and Dongmani, 
And being Asian, I think Israelis have similar um, have similar attitudes about this too with your respect respected elders, right? You don't want to do anything too crass and you don't want to make them look bad. So you don't want them to lose face. So I wasn't going to be like, no, I'm not going to direct this film. Like, what are you talking about? They're all celebrating. They opened a bottle of like fucking Johnny Walker, which is expensive in Laos. And um, so I went home drunk and I was like, the whole time I was like, do I, do I, do I, do I, to them. And then I went home and I was like, what the fuck, what the fuck, what the fuck? I can't marry this film. And Chris was like, slurring he's drunk out of his mind he's like you're gonna be fine you just read this book it's called directing you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> like director how hard it. could it be take this book and learn yeah, hard to be. <laughs> and it talks you guys it has so many references to films that i've never seen in my life and I, i i can't even remember the the films they're famous films and it's like similar to the scene in this and that film and I would have to like run to Chris and was like what happened in that movie like explain to me what this what they're talking about because I don't know what they're talking about you know <laughs> พอมุ่งหนุนเจ้าเนาะเขาก็ว่ายังชื่อบางสิ่งบางอย่างแกก็แม่เขาอยู่ท่านท่านเพื่อนอาชิธานาแปลงพาแม่ไปมุ่งก